for an entire generation. People have experienced Star Wars the only way it's been possible, on the TV screen. But if you've only seen it this way, you haven't seen it at all. This is the podcast you're looking for. We've been waiting for you. The force is strong here, even stronger than the coffee. Welcome to Coffee with Kenobi. Here are your hosts, Dan Z and Corey Club. Hello, this is Dan Z, and welcome to show number 23 of Coffee with Kenobi, a Star Wars podcast that analyzes our favorite saga in a whole new way. With me is my good friend and co-host, Corey Club. Hey, everybody. Be sure to check out our San Diego Comic-Con special edition show with Coffee with Kenobi blogger Troy Metzler and Jeff McGee as we discuss all things happening at the annual event. Make sure to catch our next episode of A Cup of Clone Wars with special guest Lair Malmid of the IndieCast and Chris Hamilton of Star Wars KidCast. We're making our way through the Season 6 of the Emmy Award winning series and the latest episodes features the Jar Jar Binks and the Mace Windu arc. A big thank you to everyone who liked and shared our Facebook page and helped us get over 2,000 likes. We're grateful for this awesome Star Wars community. In today's show, we are happy to share a cup of coffee with Adam Bray, author of Star Wars Rebels The Visual Guide. Adam will be discussing his work on the book, as well as his collaboration with the creative forces behind the upcoming series. We also discuss Celebration Anaheim and Dave Filoni news, the Disney theme park presence, the Rebels preview, and we have the next offering of your espresso shot with a bearded trio with Rob Wainfer. We'll also update you with Coffee and Kobe t-shirt news and introduce our topic for show number 24. And now, let's see what's brewing in the Star Wars universe this week. Oh, wait. This is interesting. You found something. Our first news story has to do with uh, Celebration Anaheim coming out next year. We're all looking forward to that, especially all the fantastic guests. Uh, we've had some great ones so far. Uh, James Arnold Taylor will be there. Uh, all kinds of fun things going on as, as things are ramping up for that. Uh, but today they just released that Dave Filoni will be attending the event, and we look forward to having seeing him and getting uh, to meet him possibly. And uh, obviously he's known for the Emmy Award-winning series Clone Wars uh, and upcoming Rebels series. Uh, he's principal director for all that. Uh, so, Dan, what are your thoughts on this as a, as a big announcement? It's very cool. It seems like, and you and I were just talking about this a few mm-hmm. moments ago, but now we're going to start getting, uh, hopefully, news trickling in for S- Star Wars Celebration as far as confirmed guests. We already know, as you mentioned, that James Arnold Taylor will be there and uh, as the host. And we've got Dave Filoni. He's, he's probably... Overall, I mean, I know J.J. Abrams, you could make a good argument for him, but Dave Filoni is probably uh, the second most important person in Star Wars uh, over the past 15, 20 years, I would say. So just knowing that he's going to be there is great. I mean, it would be great to shake his hand and and get a chance to speak with him, but he's going to have a lot of exciting things to do. We'll probably show previews of what's going to be coming up with Rebels. So just getting that excitement for Celebration ramping up. Absolutely, and I, I think it's good that they're announcing uh, all this kind of stuff, and it's good that Dave will be there to be able to just, just to uh, you know, be able to interact with fans and do panels maybe, um, and just it's nice to see that uh, they're really starting to get this uh, celebration uh, ramped up as far as uh, guests. Um, I know we look forward to it. Uh, I've never been there before. Uh, you've been to a couple um, celebrations. I went, yeah, I went to I went to just one. It was Celebration Three in Indianapolis. Mm-hmm. It was it was awesome. I cannot wait to go there and mm-hmm. walk around with you uh, wearing the Coffee with Kenobi banner. It'll be great. <laughs> kind of giant flag, yeah. Yeah, man. Maybe maybe we'll get camels uh, or say they're <laughs> say they're EOPs and ride around and say, "Hey, man, check us out." And then we'll make sure that they don't spit on people, of course. Of course. Uh, another little bit of news out there as far as uh, surrounding around Dave Filoni. Uh, it's been kind of rumored that maybe he'd be interested in doing a live action film. Um, I might, for myself, I think this would be a great addition to his career. Uh, he's definitely showing his chops as far as making uh, the Star Wars universe just better than it could ever be as far as mm-hmm. the Rebels and uh, Clone Wars. I'm looking forward to this for him to be able to step into some bigger shoes, if you will, uh, if this is a possibility. What are your thoughts, Dan? Yeah, this is something that I, I saw on Twitter. Um, he was he was doing an interview for, uh, for SlashFilm.com. Mm-hmm. 
And all basically, uh, before we get everybody really excited, he basically just said that he's open to it. Sure. And and I don't know about you, but the moment I heard that they were making new Star Wars films, you broke that news to me. We've talked about that before. One of the first things I thought was, well, surely I thought, wouldn't it be great if they get Steven Spielberg to do one, which doesn't appear that's going to happen. And of course, Dave Filoni. Uh, they asked him if if he would be interested uh, in a movie. Uh, and they, they said 10 years down the road, and we'll put a link in our show notes to this article, but he basically says, that's a selfish thing to say, but of course I would. I mean, if we were, were to get an opportunity like that, I wouldn't turn it down. I would see it as a great honor to do it, and I would apply all of my Jedi knowledge to doing it as best as I can. And then he sort of alludes to it in this article that he knows, and of course he knows, what's going on and what they've got planned. And, and the guy is in a walking encyclopedia. He and Pablo Hidalgo and George Lucas, they just they know their Star Wars. They're the creators of it. Uh, and, and they've just done so many amazing things with this great saga. So there isn't a Star Wars fan who has heard of Dave Filoni that does not think if this were to happen, and again, we don't usually cover speculation, but it's just something that I think everybody wishes would happen at some point. Now, naturally, um, he's doing such an amazing job with the animated world that I don't want him to leave that, but man, that would be awesome. Yeah, I think also we got to apply this to, you know, when they're announcing Episode 7, a lot of the film uh, directors that were out there kind of swirling around as far as competitors uh, for that, and I, I know a lot of them were approached, and, and some turned it down, you know, I think for, for their own reasons, and I think it's open to, to anybody at this point. I think they're still trying to nail those some of those things down. You, you mentioned Spielberg. I mean, it's I think it always seems like it's a possibility. Uh, just wait for the official announcement, of course. Uh, possibility for Spielberg or just anyone? Oh yeah, just anybody. I think it's it's a possibility, but I think they're really because he's, he's pretty much on. said, yeah, yeah. You're right. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but no, he no. pretty much said uh, that's George's world. Yeah, and in in you know and that and that's George's sandbox, so to speak. And although I don't think and and didn't he direct the big fight sequence between Anakin and Obi Wan and Revenge of the Sith? You know, I don't know. I'm pretty sure that he did. And I'm sure he's had his hand in, in a couple of things that we just don't know about. You know, I mean, they're obviously good friends. Uh, I, I'm, you know, when did ask Rob this from the beard? There you go. Yeah, yeah but uh, definitely putting Dave Filoni, like you said, Dave Filoni and Star Wars just are like Peter Burn jelly. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And I, also, I want to cover real quickly before we move on to our next story. Uh, in the announcement that StarWars.com had. Uh, with Dave Filoni uh, confirmed for celebration, they have all these different panels. Uh, there's a celebration art show, mm-hmm. um, other deadlines for fan tables and fan programming, uh, all this kind of exciting stuff like that. Interesting, they have a celebration podcast stage. That's new, Corey, and, and mm-hmm. I think it goes without saying that we will uh, certainly put our hat in the ring, so to speak. And because we want to be a part of that. Absolutely. I mean, I think um, if they're going to put something out there for a podcast to be able to, to be involved in any way, shape, or form as far as celebration and celebrating fandom of Star Wars, we'd definitely take them up on that if uh, that came available. I think, too, also it's 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 nice to see that they're reaching out to fandom in every which way, way possible as far as, like you said, uh, the fan tables and, and submitting artwork and, and fan art and things like that nature. So check out uh, the link in our show notes uh, to all that. Well, and September 30th of this year is when the podcasting application is due. So that is also my birthday. So what a, <laughs> what a great present for Lucasfilm to give to us to let us be a part of this podcasting stage. And when I hear the word stage, to me, that means a much more grandiose scope. And that, to me, that makes me cool. And I've been fortunate. I, I love hosting stuff and all that so to me, the, the more people are there to see it, the better. How do you feel about that? Are you excited about being in front of a million people? <laughs> I think it'd be wonderful to be able to just sit in front of a, a panel uh, and be able to just enjoy it in the conversation. I, I, I might be a little bit nervous, <laughs> but I'd definitely be, love to be involved in some, in some way as far as you know, being on a panel or things of that nature. Our next news story is something that just happened, uh, as did our previous story about uh, Dave Filoni and Celebration. Uh, Variety.com, who we all know and trust, uh, says that um, according to Bob Iger's most recent conference call, he says there's going to be a far greater, quote, Star Wars presence in his theme parks, uh, Iger said on Tuesday. Uh, Currently, of course, we've got Star Tours, 
uh, and things of that, things like that. Little things we've got Endor Vendor at Hollywood Studios. We've got Star Tours at Disneyland. Um, he didn't really give any details at all, but during the conference call, he said the likelihood of the success is greater for a brand when they build an attraction. Uh, as far as when we're going to find out or what it's going to be, he just basically says next year. So, oh dear, right? We got to wait again. <laughs> but at least they're coming out there saying, hey, this is going to happen. We're looking for a huge presence and we're going to announce it next year. Well, I think it's nice that they're talking about it. You know, it's in the works. Um, instead of just having a speculation. Right. Instead, instead of, you know, saying, hey, what, you know, what's going to happen? But I mean, it seems like t- next year is going to be. In a gigantic year for all things pop culture and movies and theme parks and this is right up there with that I mean Star Wars is and it seems like it's everywhere right now and just to be able to highlight that in a theme park I think it's just it's like just waiting out there just to be to be done and uh, done the right way as far as uh, putting in in Disney or wherever but uh, I'm looking forward to it myself we've talked to it numerous times about having uh, different uh, attractions there Um I think it would just it just seems like it goes hand in hand together. Our next news story has to do with a little promo released after the uh, Star Wars Face and First TV event that they had on um, on Disney. They uh, pre- premiered a, a seven minute clip of Rebels. I wasn't able to watch it until uh, later on today. Uh, Dan, you texted me asking if I'd seen the clip. I've heard I heard the news about it, but I hadn't seen it until the, this afternoon during my lunch break. My initial thoughts, I'll just start off. Overall, I thought it was really good. I really liked it. I liked the the characters to see them in action and actually see them kind of leaping into leaping into action, meeting each other. It seems like this is a fast-paced episode. I'm assuming it's from the first episode. Um, we're going to see Ezra as where kind of where he lives in his life and his interaction. And uh, I thought the interaction was really cool, I, it, meeting these characters and things. I feel like it was a little bit chopped. I wonder if that's just they're excluding some parts as far as the story-wise might go and maybe some of the things the Empire's doing. It seemed like it was very, uh, the Rebels' side, very very heavy on that part as far as you know introducing us to them. Well, I, I think that it, I have a, a myriad thoughts on mm. this, Corey, of course. the um, I do want to say right off the bat that I thought that the music... Uh, provided by Kevin Kiner, I thought was exquisite. That, yeah, in fact, that yeah. may be my favorite thing. Besides Ezra's eyes had this amazing blue to them. The, yeah, the, the color palette is, yeah, it's gorgeous. And, and I thought the music was great. You hear these little hints to the Force theme when Luke asks Obi Wan about the Force on Tatooine. You hear that when oh, yeah. when Ezra first senses Kanan's presence. I yeah. thought that was awesome. I, I love the TIE Fighters and hearing that or, original sound. It seems like from A New Hope, when the TIE Fighters are buzzing by, how wild that they're in the uh, atmosphere of Lothal well, flying also, around, right? I noticed like that first shot is Ezra on the little watchtower there, and the ship overhead is, oh my gosh, is that a homage to Episode 4 or what? Oh, I know. I totally agree. We were very excited that we got invited to go to the premiere of this in San Diego, but we weren't able to attend at this time. So, but I'm going to guess, based on what we've been hearing from our friends and online, uh, and based on what we saw last night, that this is the beginning of the first episode. Mm-hmm. Don't don't you think? I mean, just the way they're yeah, setting it's, it up. Yeah, it seems like an, a, a big setup as far as because uh, they're getting into everybody's action. already is, yeah, they're already established, and we're going to find out in a new dawn how um, how Hera and Kanan met. So this is how we're seeing how Ezra joins the crew. Uh, I do want to point out something that, that kind of rubbed me the wrong way about this. Okay. I don't know if you notice this, but the level of violence in this uh, is is strong. Now, this is war. This is rebellion, and it's going to get bloody. It's going to get messy. I think the thing for me that escalates the cost of this is when the clones died, it was sad because they're clones and we were attached to them, but somehow they were able to segue away from the peril because they were clones, quote-unquote clones. Um, and then when droids get killed, their droids are not real, right? I guess none of these things are real, obviously, but for the purposes of the show. Now, on this one, a stormtrooper gets killed. We know those are human beings. Um, and then they're trying to shoot at this kid who's a kid. I mean, he's, what is he, 14? Um, so that's interesting to me. And that doesn't necessarily turn me off by any stretch of the imagination. But, but if this is a show that's aimed at Star Wars fans, some of the fans are kids. 
Um, so do you, do you see where I'm going with this? There's, mm-hmm. it's, it's interesting that they would do that. And maybe the most unique thing to me about this idea is Zeb, when Ezra is taking off on the speeder bike with that great sound from Return of the Jedi of the speeder bikes, he says, uh, if he catches that, that kid, I'm going to end him. Like He's saying, I'm going to, to kill a child. That that and it, maybe he's just joking and he's rough around the edges. And I know practically nothing about Zeb, but it's just something that sort of jumped off the screen. I mean, I thought, oh, okay, that's pretty serious stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My my opinion on this is, um, it's interesting you, you brought this. Up. I'm glad you did. Coming off of season six, which was awfully heavy. awfully violent. I mean, I don't know yeah. if that's because it was on Netflix. They thought they could, you know, just a little more extra stuff in there. Um, but I will say it was a little more violent than I thought it would be, and I know they're really trying to look depict the Empire as, um, you know, a bully of a sense. You know, they were oh, picking yeah. on the guy on, on, on Lowell there, and you know, really just they were ready to, to t- take him away as far as doing really nothing. Yeah, and that was and my kind of my first thing was obviously they're going to you know, beef that up a little, but yeah, taking down the the stormtroopers. As they did. I mean, we don't. Oh, that part was interesting. Like the 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 physical, the, right. the fisticuffs. That was fine. But it was it was the, a good guy threatening that he was going to end a child. Right. That, that threw me. Right. No, I I I remember hearing that, and I I was thinking. Now it seems to be they're trying to enter, introduce his demeanor, and yes, I I don't think he would necessarily do that. Do that. Yeah. I think yeah. they're saying like, oh, he's a rough and tough guy. But when his dad comes down to it, he's, he's full of heart or something like that. You know, it's... Right. And every, like, we heard on Full of Sith that when they, they interviewed the cast, uh-huh. Steve Blumner, but that basically, yeah, he's he's a tough he's a tough character, but he and Ezra have this unshakable bond. And obviously, this is the very, very beginning when they first meet. And we don't know what Zeb has been through or, or what her, his experiences are. Yeah. And he may, maybe just when he gets frustrated and angry and he was just expressing himself. And, and I get that. You know, I'm, I'm not judging or or passing, you know, saying that it's going to be anything other than what it is, an exciting, powerful show with some undertones of, of rebellion. And rebellions, as we said, are bloody. They are messy. Um, but it's just something that caught my eye. I'd be curious to see what other people thought of that, too. Check out our Facebook page and, and, and see. Uh, maybe we'll start a thread on there and get people's opinions as far as uh, the, the the clip that was showing. Uh, other thoughts that I had. Um, did you feel like the dialogue was a little lacking? Can you think of a specific example? I, I, I thought Kanan was a little bit just short as far as his words. I mean, he didn't talk a whole lot as far as, you know, I, I know it, was a, it seemed like it was a secret mission. I wonder if they were just lying low. Yes. And whatever is in that box. Or, yeah. yeah. I see what you're saying. It was just kind of. It seemed quick, like a little Which little reminds cut me of a new me, hope. Yeah. Which, yeah, I guess. But it seems I like, like it, that. They, they're missing something. Well, it's true. And again, we're just getting a very, very, I mean, right. you're, a, you're a great writer. You know that at the beginning, it's sort of hard to, to kind of gauge what's going to happen because they're trying to build these characters. I'm intrigued. I was hoping to see Hera in this clip, uh, which we don't. But Sabine yeah. is someone that, that I find myself being drawn to. She's She's got some cool spunk. We heard again on those interviews on Full of Sith that, that she and Ezra, she has a harder time accepting Ezra right off the bat. That's um, interesting. Yes, but but right there it seems like she basically uh, she, cuts him loose and says, "All right, kid, you yeah. got some spunk." She, she gave him a chance to get away, and it, it's almost like if they it, people like seem to really try to find, okay, who's Han Solo in this story? But apparently, yeah. that that is probably a testament to the to the charisma of Harrison Ford on screen. Anyway, but if anyone appeared to be quote unquote like Han Solo, which I'm not necessarily a big fan of people trying to do, but if anyone is like Han Solo, it would seem to be Sabine, at least to me, and in this in this seven minute clip anyway. Sure. I, I will say that you said you we didn't see Hera, which uh, was unfortunate. You hear her voice, yeah. You hear her voice, but here's what I'm thinking happens. Mm-hmm. So the, the clip ends with a TIE fighter coming right in for Ezra, right? Oh, I like where you're going with this. And here comes the ghost ship, fly but by, it, boom, gone, and they pick him up or whatever. That's my speculation. I haven't seen yeah. the, I have not seen the first episode. Uh, I, overall, I'm I'm looking forward to it. I think it was a great seven minute clip. It gets me excited, you know. Just just of you know, we talked to Adam Ray about his Star Wars Rebels book and the, the visual guide, and gives us breakdowns for each character. And just to see them in action, 
uh, on the screen there was just exciting enough uh, to get Stunning. me just going on this. Let's I'm like eager to get into this series and I can't wait. Well, and I brought it up at the beginning when we talked about this, but do you did you notice how awesome the music was? Yes, uh, I was going to mention that you beat me to it. Uh, the music, yes, it was very, very John William esque, um, mm-hmm. and plays off these some great themes. Like you said, uh, Ezra was looking over the the stores stores there, on the mm-hmm. rooftops, and he notices uh, Kanan, and the theme was a definite uh, Skywalker's theme. So it's it was excellent. I loved a little the play, uh, and even like his little like noticing, quote unquote, noticing through the force was really nice. And did you see on Twitter, we, we got a pretty fun thread going through our Coffee with Kenobi Twitter feed, the uh, the the similarities to Aladdin. Yes. Yeah, that was yeah. cool. Stealing and listening. I, I kind of thought that too. That was yeah, it's, it's there. And, you know, he kind of has the look of Aladdin, really. Hmm. I heard Dave Filoni saying that he was inspired by, by Tangled. Oh, yeah. The animation yeah. style of Tangled. Yeah. You can kind of see that there, too. I'm, I'm not the artist that you are i mean heck i can't even draw a straight line with a ruler <laughs> but it's it's cool i mean it, i'm very very excited about it I, I wanted more that's probably the best thing yeah I say I think. About when it was over <laughs> i thought all right i need more and i believe there's going to be another eight or seven minute one next week too on the disney channel that's what aaron harris had mentioned something about that he saw a commercial for that so hopefully that's true and who knows by the time they show all these little vignettes Maybe we'll have already seen the first episode before it even aired. We'll have to wait and see. And now, let's join Rob Wainford as he pours your espresso shot with the Bearded Trio. And now, your espresso shot with the Bearded Trio. Coffee with Kenobi. Hi everyone, it's Rob Wainford here bringing you a special espresso shot with the Bearded Trio. Now, I was lucky enough to attend London Film and Comic Con at a scorching Ills Court a few weeks back, where I met some fantastic guests such as Billy D. Williams, Carrie Fisher, and a dog, and John Hurt to name a few. Now, while I was there, I was fortunate enough to catch up with Corrie D. Williams, who played Klaatu uh, in Return of the Jedi. Now, I spent a few minutes asking him a few questions. And my first question was, what scene did he do stand-in work for for his father, Billy D? And if there was anything funny he remembers from the set? Well, I was in the Sarlacc pit scene that was filmed in Yuma, Arizona. And I was hired and went there to work as a stand-in for him. And then I uh, actually ended up doing some doubling work for him in the scene where he's hanging over the side of the, it's blown over the side of the stiff. It was like 110 degrees in the shade there. And um, so they actually, you know, they had, we had to do a lot of different things to try and stay cool. Oh, one funny fact about uh, George was, now that you mentioned a funny fact, he would, he wore a flannel shirt in the desert. And he wore that shirt, the same shirt, every day throughout the whole shoot. I think I think it was like a superstitious thing. I don't know, but it was. But I remember him always being in that shirt. Maybe he had more than one of them. I don't know. But, yeah, in 110 degrees, I would say he's got more than one. Yeah, I hope. But yeah, I think I remember him actually having a flannel shirt on it. <laughs> and the funny thing is, when you're when you're out there in the desert, you have to cover your skin up. You can't expose yourself to the sun, you know, like you would think. You know, you you need to kind of cover yourself up a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> well, next, I couldn't resist asking Cory D whether he owned his own vintage Clato Kenner Star Wars figure. Here's what he had to say. Yeah, I do. They get um, actually Derek who who uh, manages us, he gave me one when I found out there was an action figure. I didn't even know until about three years ago that it even existed. Really? Yeah, and not only that, I didn't even know that Klaatu had a, had a, had a name. But, you know, when they asked me to do the stunt work as the creature, the creature, they just put that mask on my head and I just remember I couldn't see, I couldn't breathe, and they wanted me to fight with it on. <laughs> And it wasn't easy. It must have been so surreal. Like, what, what, what am I doing? 
Yeah, it was pretty surreal. I mean, and I, I didn't go there to do that. It just kind of happened. It was fortuitous that they just came to me and said, hey, we, we need you to do this, you know, and it's just, it was a spontaneous thing. And I, and I just said, okay, let's go. I bet, I bet. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, um, and the whole trip was kind of spontaneous. It was when I began standing in for my father, and I ended up doing it on a lot of other films as well. All right. Yeah. And TV shows. Wow. What, what kind? What TV shows? Well, there were pilots for TV shows that he did. Called, one was called Double Dare. One was Shooting Stars. Um, I stood in for him, and number one with a bullet, um, and did some stunts for him and different things. One of my favorite movies is the classic 1951 sci-fi movie, The Day the Earth Stood Still. Now, Klaatu, who Kari plays in Return of the Jedi, is named after a quote from that movie, which is Klaatu, Barada, Nikto. In fact, all three words of that famous quote ended up being characters in Return of the Jedi. I asked Kari if he had seen the movie, but first, if he likes sci-fi in general. On yourself. Yeah, I love sci-fi. I love sci-fi, and I especially love superhero movies. But um, which is your favorite? Batman, The Dark Knight, is my, one of my favorites. But um, yeah, I mean, I've seen the, the old classic. I don't I haven't seen it in a long time, so I don't remember a lot of details about it. Classic movie, you should watch it. Yeah, it's, it's very, it's very campy, and you know, and and just really cool. And then I also I worked in another movie that was called Buckaroo Bond. And I was a, I was Electroid in that movie. Really? Yeah. <laughs> they made a, a plaster cast of my head and then um, built these uh, rubber prosthesis. And I had to go through like five or six hours of makeup at the crack of dawn because it was a speaking role. But Clat 2, just, it was just a head that Velcroed up the back. And now, the full name of that movie Kari mentioned is called The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension. No, you need to check it out or at least watch the trailer on YouTube. Uh, it's a very strange movie, but it does star Robocop's Peter Weller, John Lithgow, and a very young Jeff Goldblum. Oh, and Christopher Lloyd appears in the movie too. So next I asked Corey if Richard Marquand was doing most of the directing on Return of the Jedi or if George Lucas was calling the shots. Here's what he had to say. Well, yeah, George was there. I think it was a combination of the two of them. Um... George was definitely a part of, of it, but I think he was probably so exhausted by, um, I, guess, I think he learned his lesson trying to do too much on the, on the very first Star Wars film that he probably needed to kind of delegate some of the other responsibilities to other people at that point, but he was surely actively involved. He was there on the set when I was there. So. Well, moving away from movies for just a moment, Corey is now a fitness and lifestyle coach. And having spent the weekend myself living on burgers and traditional English breakfasts, I was feeling particularly unhealthy. I couldn't go without asking him some tips on how to stay healthy, so I asked him what the one bit of advice he would give to someone to keep fit and healthy. Here's what he had to say. Well, I would say um, if you don't have time to exercise, then exercise and make time for everything else. Um, it's important to do it for your health and um, there are so many benefits and there are so many ways to do it and so many ways to go about it and everyone can find something that suits them but I always tell people that what they need to do is start off with 10 minutes a day of something, anything and um, get in the habit of doing it and then once you're in the habit of doing it then you can increase the amount of time you spend so baby steps that's good advice I might take you up on that one <laughs> but there we go Corey D there giving some tips on how to keep fit well back to movies now and I suspect we all know the answer to this one but I asked him what his favourite Star Wars movie is here's what he had to say oh and listen out for Corey D's impression of Lando Calrissian yeah, that's a no-brainer, right? <laughs> Return of the Jedi is probably my favorite Star Wars movie by far, I think. Not just because I was in it, but I just I just really like the way that they wound everything up in that movie in the first three movies. And uh, I 
that to me it's the, it's one of the, it's the best of the three. But but I also like Empire because there was some scenes that my father had with Darth Vader in there where he kind of challenged him, and nobody ever got away with that. We used to joke about it and laugh and say, you know, you're the only guy who ever talked loud or raised his voice to Darth Vader and made it to the next scene, <laughs> much less to the next movie. You know, <laughs> he was like Lord Vader, Lord Vader. You know, that wasn't the condition of our agreement. No, it was given hand to that bounty hunter. Your father is so cool. He cheated unfairly. Cory D doing Lando, and he's got the laugh too. Now, my final question to Corey D, um, I couldn't go without asking him if he'd like to be in Star Wars 7 or a future Star Wars movie. Here's his answer. Well, who would say no to that opportunity? I mean, hello out there. You know, anybody that wants me to put on another mask or do another anything, I'm available. <laughs> we'll make sure we get the message out there for you. <laughs> right. Really, it's been a pleasure talking to you, uh, Curry D. Williams. Thank you for taking the time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. You're quite welcome. I really enjoyed my time here in London, my first time here. Took the tube and saw some sights and actually saw the city for a change. Usually you don't. So thank you so much. Corey wants in. I hope you're listening, JJ. What a great guy uh, Corey D. Williams is. And I want to thank him again for taking the time during a really busy London film and Comic Con to answer a few questions. He really does follow his father for the cool factor. Well, that's it from me. I hope you enjoyed the interview. Don't forget to follow The Bearded Trio on Twitter and Facebook, and you can check out the main site too. If you want to contact me by email, then rob at thebeardedtrio.com is where I'm at. Uh, And that's it from me. Thanks again for listening, and I'll hand you back to Coffee with Kenobi. Goodbye. Han Solo, Rebel Soldier, Lando Calrissian, and Bespin Guard each sold separately from Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back Collection, new from Kenner. Looking? Found someone you have, I would say, hmm? Your lightsabers will make a fine addition to my collection. Our first news item for Collector's News, we're big fans of the Star Wars novels, uh, obviously anticipating the releases coming out uh, this year. And next year with the new novels, especially uh, Star Wars A New Dawn by John Jackson Miller. We do follow the Dilray uh, books on Facebook, and they put out a lot of great information and, and things like that, the nature of, of upcoming events. And they kind of posted something that has to, to, to do with the Legends, the EU line, and the characters there. Uh, Dan, you want to explain a little more of that? Yeah, I, I'm just going to read it real quick. Because sure. it's it's um, they're, them sort of addressing which what I'm assuming is going to be a very popular question that they have received, and it says... Yeah. We wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that we read the comments and posts addressed to us throughout the weekend, and we appreciate the passion you all have for the Star Wars Expanded Universe. The Delroy team has worked for many years on these books, and we all share your love for the Legends, EU characters, and stories. As we have stated, there are currently no plans for new books under the Legends banner. What we can assure you of, as big fans and readers ourselves, We're extremely excited about the direction Star Wars storytelling is taking, and we're thrilled to be a part of it. There's a deeper level of collaboration with Lucasfilm and his partners that we're confident will provide you, the readers, with amazing Star Wars stories in books, comics, television, video games, and movies. Not only does this mean more Star Wars stories, but it also means we can officially say for the first time that the books are part of the canon. Again, we all have tremendous love and admiration for the EU slash Legends tales, and they will continue to inspire and influence stories that will be told for generations to come. That is evident in John Jackson Miller's new novel, Star Wars, A New Dawn. So basically, this is just them coming out there and saying, we hear you, uh, we appreciate your sentiment and your passion, and we feel the same way. It's just for right now, we're going to focus on the canon, and those are the things will continue to inspire that. Which, basically, Dave and... Everyone else has, has been saying for a while now, and Steve Sansfield said it on our show, and, you know, I, I'm glad that they addressed it. So we've got a lot going on, uh, as always, when it comes to Star Wars these days. Uh, tell me your thoughts on all this Star Wars goodness, my friend. Yeah, it's. I'm glad they, it, they brought this out, too, because I feel like they're going to be fighting this maybe more than once uh, throughout the 
the career here as far as Del Rey team and, and you know producing Lucasfilm stuff. And I feel like they're just they're kind of a third party, and uh, you know they're just trying to contribute uh, you know good stories and putting stuff out there and just trying to you know obviously do good by by Star Wars. And um, we we got nothing but but good stuff from them over the years. I would say. I mean, all the the uh, Legends line are, are good books, and good novels, and uh, certainly you could you can go back and pick them up whenever you'd like and read those and enjoy them as, as tales. And we've said it before. You know, same thing with the Dark Horse comics. I know that Marvel's taken that over. It seems like it's cementing a new uh, a new um, a new dawn. <laughs> yeah, a new dawn. Exactly. It's really what it is. I mean, we've talked about this before where comic books are constantly having different timelines uh you know there's earth 2 and dc there's all kinds of different timelines in marvel series and, and different characters that interact with each other and they always cross paths and things like that what i'm excited about i think is to see the tricklings of the legends banner uh and these new books I, they've got to pull stuff from it i mean yeah I, I feel like it's gonna always be there it's it's a giant mine shaft of 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 knowledge and exciting things and you know it's they're not there they're putting it aside or, or discounting it by any means i, I think no. it seems like it's uh, you know a lot of folks even c- commented underneath this this message you know kind of putting it down as far as you know the eu and when they kind of cut it loose and they let it go and I don't think that's true at all. I think they're just, they had to make a decision as far as a company, as far as a story group goes. I think it was a difficult decision for them to make. Uh, but I also think that, you know, they're doing the right thing to be able to, to start fresh. It just makes sense yeah. because you, and maybe this is a lot easier for me to grasp onto and own this principle because I've always understood that they're not canon. It's just like another way to look at it. I like how our, our last listener from uh, the last show, um, you talked to us about, and I, I can't think of his name off the top of my head, so I apologize, my friend. Uh, but he talked about it so much like King Arthur. And it very oh, much yeah. is King Arthur has all these legends. And the word legend is an incredibly complimentary adjective to describe uh, what these stories are. And, and like you said, they're, they're going to trickle through everywhere. And, you know, Star Wars bookworms and the Star Wars report and Star Wars stacks and all these other great Star Wars podcasts and Club Jade and all these people out there. They're going to catch all these things probably a lot more quickly and astutely than I am because I'm not as familiar with every single EU book that was ever published, although I've certainly read a lot more, especially over the past few years. But it, it's going to be there. It's going to be a part of it. And knowing that they're not tied down to 30 plus years of expanded universe stories and can kind of go forward and, and take it in new exciting directions, that is something to be excited about. Our next collector's news segment isn't really collector news related, but it just fits here better. We wanted to talk really, really briefly about Guardians of the Galaxy. And this is, of course, an insanely popular film that just came out last weekend. Corey and I, uh, believe it or not, even though we only live five minutes away from each other, we don't get to hang out as much as we would like because we're we're busy. We're busy young men with families and such. Um, But we did get a chance to sneak out and go see the film together Had a really interesting discussion about it and we wanted to carry that discussion over to the air and and i'll just go ahead and start by saying i think it's pretty clear to anyone who's ever heard me talk about movies before that i'm kind of a slice and dice sort of guy i'm i'm pretty strict and critical of things and i certainly have a way of looking at it i was disappointed by a lot of films this summer i don't know if i you could say i was disappointed by transformers because i expected it to stink and it did (laughs) um but i loved this movie i thought it was tremendous i thought it was everything i want from a summer movie but more because i really thought there was real heart i really thought each character had an interesting arc they came to some sort of resolution it was they weren't fixed they're still psychologically flawed but the family dynamic was great. You can't ignore the humor and the witty dialogue, the delivery, the charisma of the cast. I thought it was just tremendous. What about you? Yeah, I found myself just pleasantly surprised as far as just enjoying the film and, and not having going in, uh, not having to know too much. Uh, and I, like you said, the cast was incredible. I think every cast member did a great job. I enjoyed the interactions between the, the characters. Uh, it was just a fun popcorn comic book movie. And, and even that, I mean, to me, it wasn't necessarily a comic book movie. It was just an adventure, sci-fi, you know, blast-off type movie just to enjoy and 
and have a good time. And, and, and like you said, you're very analytical about things. And I think that's what you bring to the show, obviously, uh, and, and makes it so good is the oh, fact thanks. that you will sit down and chop things up and, and, and dissect it. And I think that's wonderful. And, and I, I wouldn't say I'm the total complete opposite, but I, I, I believe I'm, I, I do sit back a little bit and, and breathe things in and then take time afterwards to, to, to dissect it myself. But I, like you said, it has heart. It has laughs. It has explosions. It has a little bit for almost everybody. Yeah, and like in the end, they're just, I mean, Groot is just, because he's become an instant sci-fi cult hero. I mean, people love <laughs> Groot. And, and I understand why he's just, in fact, when I saw this scene at the end, which I won't spoil for people, I thought, oh man, this is, this is going to be something. This is like an iconic moment. In, in sci-fi film history. This is this is pretty good stuff. I, I think, again, I was the most impressed with the fact that this felt original to me. They, Marvel mm-hmm. took, to me, a bigger risk with this than anything because none of these characters are really known at all. And I've been collecting comics most of my life, and I'm even vaguely familiar with some of these characters. And I understand now that one of the reasons they took a big chance is because a lot of the other heroes already owned up by other companies so Marvel didn't really have that many more characters they could explore so this just seemed like the way to go and it was great I, again I, I'm just so happy with how the fact is that even though um, you were you were mentioning both on Facebook and with me and when we were talking about this the other night um, how did it impact you knowing that there was going to be a sequel before you even saw this movie yeah I heard the announcement just before we kind of, you know, made plans to go see it that night that they're, you know, making a sequel. And I thought, well, that's really cool. But, you know, I haven't even seen the first movie yet. And I, I think that's it's kind of a crazy move. And I seem like that's kind of the, the norm now. It seems like let's just announce a tons of movies that are slate for the next 15 years. And it ruins things uh, for me as a fan, I think. It, it, it doesn't give en- enough peril to the characters in the film uh, themselves. I mean... Obviously, they're not going to kill off the heroes, uh, you know, in any circumstance. But you still want to be able to get excited and feel tension and excitement and be able to, to live through those moments with those characters and kind of be on the edge of your seat and, and curious to know what's going to happen next. Uh, and then not to spoil anything for anybody themselves. I mean, yeah. it's, it's out there. It's news. But, I mean, I'm excited for a second movie. But I, I'm also not excited because I think this is such a nice hit from Marvel. Uh, like you said, uh, you even said this. I think even before the first trailer came out, this this is a, a risk for Marvel, mm-hmm. and um, they did a great job with it. They did did, did a good job uh, with the characters and, and just making that transition. And I think to make this just a single shot and be able to put it out there and just to be able to enjoy it is, is good enough for me. And let's let, let's use you know Marvel dollars. From this film and focus on somebody else or a new different group like you said they take a big risk with this why not shoot for the stars and, and you know try something else like a nova movie or something like that i mean i don't know it's mm. it seems like uh ramping don't you up want more sequel. chris don't you want more chris pratt though yeah I, chris that pratt was, was pretty awesome, awesome. <laughs> he was he was he he had that christmas christmas that swagger and yeah and let's just bring this up now sure um there are a lot of comparisons of this to star wars mm-hmm. what are your thoughts on that yeah, a good friend of mine uh, had seen it before I did, and um, he commented. I usually ask him for like a two or three words, you know, review, uh, not to ruin it for myself. But he said it's a rock and roll Star Wars. Oh, and I was like, that's I like you know, that. that. I like that a lot. That's really cool. And a lot of folks online have been comparing it to Star Wars a lot, and uh, some folks have mentioned that it's 2014's Star Wars for this generation, and. I mean, you know, I obviously take away a lot of Star Wars uh, little uh, memorandums or, or hints or mm-hmm. just throwbacks to the, the, the franchise. And obviously, a lot of films do that in general. I saw a commercial the other day that did a Star Wars reference. I mean, it's it's in pop culture, so what's out it's there. It's getting to be like Shakespeare. It's, it's, yeah, that's very true. It's, that's it's, it's everywhere. It's, it's ubiquitous, you might even say. So would you agree to that fact that it's... This generation's Star Wars, or what? no, no, I, 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 uh, ge- yeah. I don't think so. It's this generation Star Wars is Star this Wars. Is Star Wars exactly, exactly? Yeah. It's not dead by any means. No, and obviously we're gonna see, like just like the with the Star Trek uh, series, it's it's gonna be new. It's gonna feel fresh. It's gonna be new actors. It's gonna look 
crisp on the screen because of the digital, you know, design. And that's what is the way it's going to be because of the, the technology of the times. Uh, now, because Star Wars is such has such prevalence, it seems like we pick apart every little, you know, TV show or movie that comes out and try to relate it to that. Or, you know, that guy's like Han Solo or, or that guy's yeah. the Luke Skywalker, you know. And I, I don't understand. I mean, I understand because mm-hmm. people love Han Solo. And we just want to keep him alive and vibrant in the culture. Well, right. he is, you know. Sure. These characters are. that They're just like a part of everyday life for, for, uh, for the media, for culture, and for a lot of fans. And I think that's great. Personally, for me, when I was watching this, if any movie came to my mind, it was right as the Lost Ark at the very, very beginning. And that was for probably for about 20 seconds. Yeah. And then it went away. You know what I mean? And then yeah. I just embrace this story, this universe, this world that that was being created and by James Gunn. And I loved it. I thought it was so much fun. But I don't... And we talked about this with our the, the discussion of Rebels earlier on the show. But to me, there's there are, there's, there's, there's a ragtag group of heroes that become a, a family. And there's someone who's a little bit cynical. And there's a tall guy that's unique he's not hairy but he's made of tree bark <laughs> you know there's a, a shorter hairy character who's who's a beloved character already I love rocket he's just yeah, he a lot of great. fun bradley cooper it was almost unrecognizable as bradley cooper just yeah. shows the range yeah. of his acting he's got some chops man it does uh, so other than that i just don't i just don't gravitate towards that idea of comparing it to stars because it's its own thing i mean i understand as well as is anyone the idea of where stories come from and how they are related to stories from the past? I mean, you know, things have come from the Beowulf, they've come from the Odyssey, they've come from King Arthur. Every story influences the next story to a certain degree. And that's as it should be. That's just called storytelling and mythology. Right. And I love that. Um, if anything, there's probably more similarities between this and Rebels. Uh, just based on what I've seen, or probably Firefly. Yeah, I was going to mention Firefly and, too. And are you a big Firefly person? I am. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not necessarily a full brown coat, if you want to call it that. Oh, nice. <laughs> but I do. I do enjoy Firefly. It was a lot of fun, and and that's again why that was so beloved by by fans because it was harkening back to Star Wars, and that was and Nathan Joss Fleet was supposedly Star Han Wars. Solo, right? Right. I mean, but that's but that's, that. Eh. Eh. See, we can discuss that later. But I'm just saying, like, I, like you said, a lot of people riff from Star Wars because that's that's what it was, and we believe like we an can, homage. It yeah. is an homage, and Star Wars was an homage to Joseph Campbell's work. So, and Flash Gordon, yeah. right? Flash Gordon, exactly. And it's it just seems like that's just generational. So it's mm. it's going to be generational, and Star Wars has lasted and, and been beloved for so long. So we'll just probably take this on forever so it's just uh, i'm excited for it and i love garden of the galaxy it was a lot of fun so I, i'm excited for the sequel yeah I, you know i'll be honest Andy, this sounds really weird especially for me because i'm using it like this but when there's about 20 minutes left in the film i thought i can't wait for the sequel even though i'm not <laughs> even done with this movie i can't wait for the sequel because the hype is so fun well, you definitely I think that is things. A, well it does and that is a testament this movie is a prime example of what good marketing can do because yeah. the trailers were so successful, and I and I was pretty skeptical of the first trailer, but it turned out to be a colossal success, and it's all due to how they they made this happen. They built this enthusiasm and excitement for something that had no real built-in fan base. Right now, take this level of marketing and, and charisma and this good cast, and put that in episode seven and. Oh my goodness! I can't even imagine. Yeah. I can't even imagine what we have in store. Well, even put it into Rebels. I mean, yeah, even that's ramping up now, and it's and we kind of well we know somewhat of the characters what we've seen so far. But yeah, it, that's right up there with with Rebels and Guardians of the Galaxy. It's just that that unknown factor is really nice to have. Hi, this is Adam Bray, author of Star Wars Rebels, The Visual Guide, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z and Corey Club. This is the podcast you're looking for. Luke, you're going to find that many of the truths we cling to depend greatly on our own point of view. I must be allowed to speak. You've taken your first step into a larger world. Our topic for show number 23 is Rebels. 
What are you looking forward to with this promising new series? What have you thought about the trailers and official news so far? Which characters resonate with you at this point and why? What themes are you starting to notice based on what we have seen? Joining us on this topic is friend of the show and author of Star Wars Rebels, The Visual Guide, Adam Bray. Adam's excellent book is full of stunning visuals and promising information about the upcoming series. He is a composer, photographer, illustrator, and author of many guidebooks and has written for CNN, the BBC, and National Geographic. His enthusiasm and knowledge of Star Wars is inspiring, and we are happy to have him join us for a cup of coffee. Welcome, Adam. Hey, thanks for having me. It's, it's a real honor to be on with you guys. Oh, absolutely. Well, the, the honor is ours. Uh, we were just so thrilled to receive your, a copy of your book, Rebels, A Visual Guide. And, and we were curious uh, and wanted to know if you could talk to us about your experiences as a writer and how did that lead to Star Wars? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I, uh, I started out, uh, as you alluded to, started out as a travel writer. Um, I was writing uh, guidebooks uh, in Asia and uh, doing travel articles uh, for CNN and uh, CNN Travel and, and some other media outlets. Uh, and uh, one of my earliest uh, book publishers was, <clears throat> excuse me, was uh, DK. And uh, I, you know, I, I'm a lifelong Star Wars fan. So actually, when I started with DK in in their travel section. I was very aware that, uh, that they did, uh, you know, the really great Star Wars guides. But uh, obviously, travel and, and Star Wars are two two very different niches. So it, uh, you know, I, I had to to stick with travel because that was what I was doing at the time. But uh, you know, I kind of put that in my back pocket as an idea. You know, maybe in the future, you know, I could kind of switch over and, and work in the, the Star Wars section. But uh, so I worked on uh, their travel guides for uh, several years, and uh, eventually I came back to the U.S. and uh, jumped right back into my uh, Star Wars fandom, and I went to Celebration 6 and uh, got re-familiarized with all of the, the great Star Wars blogs and uh, you know the authors and, and what's new and going on in the Star Wars universe. And I uh, got talking uh, with... Uh, another Star Wars author and uh, put me in touch with uh, the, just the right people uh, in the DK Star Wars. And uh, so I just, I moved on over to them. And my first, first Star Wars book was uh, What Makes a Monster, uh, which uh, is a kid's book that came out, um, I think in uh, March. And uh, yeah, the, the DK uh, Lucasfilm liked that. And so they asked me to work on uh, the Rebels visual guide. So that, uh, that's my, my most recent book for DK. And uh, really, it's, it, it was a lot of fun. It, it's the most enjoyable book I've uh, written and worked on for sure. Uh, so I'm, I'm just thrilled and uh, excited about the book and ex- excited about the Rebels TV series for sure. Oh, yes, absolutely. And, and it, real quick segue for you. You mentioned uh, all your experiences as a travel writer. Uh, are you a Mark Twain fan, considering all the travel writing he did? Um, I am, but, you know, I haven't, I haven't written since I was a kid. But I, I know, you know, back in school, I really, I really loved uh, the Mark Twain stories, um, Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn and, Finn and all of that. So, yeah, it was, it was definitely inspiring as a kid. Oh, cool. The only reason I'm bringing it up is uh, in my in my role as an educator, I, we do, we talk about Mark Twain, and he was his very first book, The Innocence Abroad, was a book about um, him going over to Europe, and it was really really funny. I, I bet you'd love it, and I'm sure listeners are like, "That's nice, Dan. Can you get back to Star Wars?" <laughs> no, no, yeah, it's yeah the. This day and age, a lot of the the classical authors uh, really get. Uh, they kind of get uh, ignored and overlooked, and I, I think they're really important. I really enjoy, um, you know, the hi- historic adventures and uh, you know, old memoirs of you know explorers back you know a hundred hundred years ago. And I think that's that's part of why I really like uh, Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones has been a real big uh, influence on me uh, to you know to get me exploring and, and traveling around the world. So. Yeah, I like those old uh, old travel tales. Well, uh, Indiana Jones is certainly the world traveler, as are you. And uh, 
just from your experience as a world traveler um, and explorer, how have those helped shape the Star Wars Rebels uh, visual guide? Yeah, uh, well, uh, the Rebels visual guide is is essentially a guidebook. Um, it's uh, you know, it's it's introducing you uh, kind of kind of like a traveler uh, in a completely new and unfamiliar area of the Star Wars universe. Um, and the book, uh, the Rebels Visual Guide, it's very uh, location and experience oriented. Uh, in addition to these these new characters and ships, uh, so it's uh, yeah, it kind of uh, dissects Star Wars Rebels uh, very much the way uh, a travel guide does, very much the way DK's uh, guides do in particular. And uh, both books required, both travel guides and uh, the Rebels visual guide required a lot of uh, research um, and uh, observation uh, and uh, just really, you know, really uh, going through the reference material over and over again uh, that uh, I was given for Star Wars Rebels. Actually, there's... Yeah, I definitely spent far more time studying the materials that I was given and doing background research by looking um, at other uh, Star Wars books from the past, uh, other DK books, um, at uh, John Rinsler's uh, Making of Star Wars, um, and other you know uh, comics and novels, and rewatching. Uh, 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 bits of the movies and clips and things to to kind of help me fill in uh, fill in some of the the little gaps and and the background information. So, yeah, it's, there's there's actually more research involved uh, in doing a guide like the Rebels Guide than the actual writing. Um, more time in the research, and that's that's very much the way a travel guide is. Is most of it is about about the research. It sounds it sounds really engaging, like a heck of a lot of fun, especially when you're spending time with something you love. And speaking of that, uh, we as fans uh, certainly would love to know about your creative process working with Dave Filoni and the Lucasfilm Story Group. A uh, very exciting, bold new venture that Star Wars has undertaken over the past few months. So we've got this series and characters that are virtually unknown to Star Wars fans. So how did your research and collaboration with Dave and the Lucasfilm Story Group help bring this book to fruition? Sure. Um, it's definitely, it was a very informal uh, process. Uh, uh, basically, uh, what, what Lucasfilm uh, sent, uh, sent to the publishers and I um, as a whole, of course, that's going to determine the, the scope of the book and what, what the book's going to cover. We're not going to go you know, beyond what Lucasfilm sends us. Um, so they, to start out, uh, Lucasfilm didn't place any particular demands on me. They just, uh, they sent me, uh, all, all the reference materials and said, this is what we've got so far. And this is what you've got to work with and kind of, kind of have fun. Um, you know, but we start, uh, we start with, uh, an outline of the book, uh, some ideas that, uh, we want to, we want to cover and, uh, the, the publisher and Lucasfilm, uh, work out kind of the skeleton of the book. Um, and, uh, uh, they, you know, of course, uh, from start through, uh, through, you know, as I'm working on the book, you know, they send me, uh, concept art uh, and uh, scripts and outlines. Um, they send me uh, images from the show, and, and there's uh, a lot of there's emails uh, back and forth between uh, myself and uh, Leland Chi and uh, the team at Lucasfilm whenever I've got questions. Wow! And uh, so yeah, I just uh, start to put things uh, t- together, and uh, it's. It was really exciting to uh, receive this stuff. I, I started working on uh, the book, started receiving materials back in January. Um, so to, to see all this stuff well ahead of, of anybody else, and you know, and to to read what uh, what they've they've got for the stories, it's really exciting because, as you said, it's a completely new part uh, of the Star Wars universe. And it's uh, yeah, I could I could hear the John Williams uh, scores in my head uh, while I'm reading, and I it definitely Rebels brings me back to the to the time of you know when I was a little kid uh, back in the '80s watching Star Wars, and 
I'm sure you guys have seen uh, the new uh, the new clips that uh, Lucasfilm has put out from Rebels uh, this week and uh, last week. So maybe maybe you guys feel the same way. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, it's it, really amazing, and I think uh, Simon, uh, Greg, uh, and Dave have all done a fantastic job. Um, the writers. The writers on uh, Rebels are just just really amazing. The the stories are just they're great. They're they're creative. They're they're really evocative uh, of Star Wars. Um, they're funny, uh, very funny. Uh, you know, they had me laughing out loud. Uh, and uh, but yeah, as as I get all these things, I really have to. Uh, you know, because everything is in story form, and uh, you know, I get art, and I. But to write a book, you know, you've really got to take that all in as a whole, and then deconstruct it, uh, and uh, figure out, you know, who each, how to define each of these characters. You know, they, they've Lucasfilm and Dave Filoni and the gang have created the characters in the story, but it's my job to uh, summarize them uh, and introduce them. Uh, so that that takes some time to to study what they've given me, uh, but they did get, again. They gave me a lot of freedom, um, and they you know there there are things that uh, they they leave me you know back small things background details, uh, particularly like uh, diagramming you know the, the ships and the weapons and uh, you know coming up with names for parts and things. They they leave some of that to me uh, to write and. Uh, but when when I put it all together, then of course it, it goes back. Eventually, it goes back to Lucasfilm, uh, and there's some back and forth between Lucasfilm and the publisher, and uh, they 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 come to the, the the final version, and everything gets uh, you know approved by Lucasfilm before uh, it goes to the printer. But it's all it's all a very very satisfying uh, experience for me. I'm I'm thrilled with the uh, the process and how things turned out. Well, how incredible that you you get to contribute to canon. I mean, that's amazing. Yeah, well, of course, most of the the credit, uh, you know, is belongs to to Dave Filoni and the team at Lucasfilm. But yeah, the the little things that uh, they they let me uh, contribute to, it's I'm I'm amazed. <laughs> I still can't believe that I've been given the honor uh, to work on this book that uh, essentially in, introduces the TV series. It's it's a cre- an incredible honor, and uh, just working with the material. I, I was such a fan of uh, of you know the the whole Luke, Dave Filoni and Lucasfilms uh, the team, a fan of their work on the Clone Wars and and ev- everything else, and and just to be able to to work on this book for the for the new series it's i'm honored it's a thrill i i still don't believe that that it's happened like you know i I can't believe it when i look look at the book and you know it's it's just amazing certainly uh dk was kind enough to send us along some copies and i know that i've enjoyed it and uh, dan as well and especially Mm -hmm. my kids have enjoyed it as well they basically yanked it out of my hand before I got past page two and I really enjoyed it so far and, and just look at just the little details and things are just really excellent. Uh, my, my oldest son likes nonfiction books a lot. So this was kind of right up his alley as far as getting into the details and things like that. Uh, but I'm curious to know uh, what unique challenges did you come up against uh, exploring uh, this new area of Star Wars? Well, this was only uh, my, like I said, my second book, um, for DK Star Wars about Star Wars, um, so it's still still working on uh, the Rebels visual guide. It's still very much uh, a learning process for me. Uh, still uh, learning, you know what what the boundaries are, and you know what what you know what, what the resources that are available to me, and you know what I can ask, and how much I can impose on people. And you know, because because I'm a fan too, you know, I mm-hmm. and I I you know I. I really look up to these guys uh, at Lucasfilm, uh, you know, for the the really amazing creative people that they are. And so, I, I, I beginning starting out, I didn't know how much you know how much I should bug them. Uh, but so yeah, learning learning the ropes and everything uh, was was new to me. And I, I, as I went, um, the the most challenging thing uh, was because uh, beginning in January, you know, they've 
Lucasfilm has had to kind of hit the ground with their feet running uh, with all of this. And so things were still very much in production um, while I was starting to write the book. Um, and they were still, you know, working on episodes, still working on animation. Um, you know, they're still actively involved in producing uh, the first season. So, you know, they, they didn't have uh, much finished uh, material for me to to look at or get references from so at times i had to work or kind of imagine and, and look a little further ahead than where they actually were uh based on the information they given me um so uh that uh it kind of that helped place some of the boundaries on what we would cover in the book, uh, but it also left me, you know, with little holes in uh, background details, mostly things that you know that you're not going to see on camera anyway. But the, like you know, like the diagrams and the parts for the ships, and talking about uh, some of, some of the weapons and and hardware and things, and some you know the background details basically. And so uh, I had to to fill in some of those things. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's because it's, it's a completely new corner of the galaxy that we've never seen before. There, there wasn't uh, a lot of background material that's directly applicable. Uh, there, there really wasn't any. Um, you know, in, in the near future, we're going to have uh, books like uh, Ryder Wyndham's um, Ezra's Gamble. If, if you've seen the, the cover of that, it's, it's got Ezra and uh, the main character and uh, the bounty hunter uh, Bosk. Uh, and uh, G- uh, John Jackson Miller's uh, new book, A New Dawn, uh, will come out, I think, in September. And Jason Fry has another book focusing on a character that's, that's in the Rebels Guide, but I don't think Lucasfilm has officially announced yet. But anyway, the, these books are, that are coming out soon are, I, I'm... I'm under the impression they're all talking about backstories uh, for the series. But when I'm starting, there were no back series, uh, uh, backstories uh, to, to draw from, for my understanding. So I had to go back and, uh, you know, do a lot of research looking at uh, things like uh, DK's uh, complete uh, vehicles and uh, complete locations and the, their previous visual guides Um John Rensler's Making of Star Wars. Uh, I looked at, you know, old uh, uh, Dark Horse uh, comic books, um, you know, from what other things from what I know of uh, novels and uh, other other Star Wars media to, to get references because I wanted where I had to fill in fill in details that hadn't been, uh, you know, hadn't been given to me by Lucasfilm. I wanted to draw on things that already existed in, in the, what was then known as the EU to make them believable, um, to make them familiar to uh, Star Wars fans and to, to make them realistic. Uh, so yeah, the, it, it was challenging to decide, uh, you know, how and where to, where to pull things uh, in. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it was a very rewarding experience, and uh, yeah, it, it was a blast. Oh, and and you can tell it just by looking through this gorgeous book. There are just so many fun, engaging things. I loved, uh, like Corey said, when you get it, you just can't put it down. And personally, my kids are younger, like really young, so they didn't they didn't grab it from me, which is good because I probably would have had to fight them off for it, uh, like Corey with his kids. <laughs> Um, but you you introduced right. some interesting things um, adding to the Star Wars mythology. Is, but what are some of the prominent themes uh, that Rebels will explore that you feel will add to the mythology of Star Wars? Well, I've got to tread lightly here because this sure. is uh, kind of the, the realm of uh, Dave and Simon and uh, Greg. Um, but I think um, I think Dave has uh, already talked about uh, the idea uh, in Rebels that uh, and. and Star, Star Wars in general, but I think uh, in Rebels that, you know, family is more than blood. Uh, the, the, these Rebels, you know, they're, they're very diverse. You know, you've, you've got uh, men and women and uh, a variety of aliens, you know, Twi'leks and the Lasats. And you've got this, this brand new droid that I love to death, the uh, Chopper. Um, 
and they're all very different. They're all very diverse, uh, and uh, yet they're they're forming uh, this this unit where they've you know they've got to learn to uh, d- depend and rely on each other. Um, so I think that that's an important important theme that Dave has already talked about. Um, the uh, another is that. Uh, uh, and again, this is this is something you you find in Star Wars already. Uh, that, that really Star Wars is for everybody. Um, it doesn't exclude. Uh, you know, it's it's for all ages. Uh, you know, men and, and women, whatever your background, uh, which is a wonderful thing. Um, and but also the idea that absolutely anything can happen in Rebels. Uh, these are brand new characters. Uh, at a brand new place in the universe on the planet Lothal. You know, it's not like uh, the Clone Wars where we knew where a lot of the characters started in episode two and we knew where they were ending up, you know, in episode three. We knew that Anakin was, you know, eventually becomes Darth Vader and, you know, what happens to Obi-Wan and and Padme. Um, But here with uh, this new Rebels team, we have no idea, you know, what will actually happen to the individual characters or, or anybody else that gets introduced in this series. You know, we, we may, you know, we may have assumptions, presumptions and uh, guesses based on, you know, how things go in A New Hope, but, since these characters don't exist in uh, episodes um, four, five, and six, you know, anything can happen. So that's that's pretty exciting. This that situation hasn't existed in Star Wars since the original first three movies. Uh, so this this takes us, you know, back kind of to the scenario where Star Wars began. And that that's really exciting because, you know, the prequels didn't do that. The Clone Wars didn't do that, but but Rebels does. Exactly. And I think that's the best thing about something we love is the mystery that it brings, uh, especially with this Rebels series. I'm looking forward to it. Dan's looking forward to it. You're obviously looking forward to it in a big way. But it, you've, like Absolutely. you said before, uh, <laughs> you're, you're a lifelong Star Wars fan, and, and we love having just fans on just to talk talk shop here and um well so what in your opinion would be the uh quiz was quintessential mythology for today's audience and how uh will rebels help enhance the saga well i think um start out because ezra and sabine are uh so young um they're uh they're early teens uh so the the two of the main characters in this um that uh, young kids can really relate to uh and that's that's something that some of us uh, older fans you know who who grew up with the original trilogy we forget that uh, you know George Lucas created Star Wars for for kids because uh, we were kids when we first saw it so that's um that's kind of that's uh, another way that uh, Rebels is going to connect uh, with the next generation and keep things fresh and alive because kids today are going to relate to them and, and believe me, uh, you know, us adults are going to go going to love it just as much. Um, but I think uh, one of the things uh, that um, that really helped connect it uh, with with today's audience uh, is is the uh, the continuing idea uh, in Rebels and in Star Wars in general uh, that anybody can contribute um, that uh, Ewoks you know played a pivotal role uh, in Return of the Jedi and Gungans in uh, the Phantom Menace and I'm sure we will continue to see throughout Star Wars you know unlikely characters. Uh, that are underestimated and looked down upon that, that end up playing the, you know, the pivotal role. Uh, other things uh, that make it important um, are the, the themes of uh, loyalty and, and relationships, um, the importance of uh, family, uh, which we see all through six films. Um, I think uh, one of the the things that I really appreciate about Star Wars is that it's something the whole family can enjoy. Um, whether you know you're a kid or you're a grandparent, you know there's something that you can get out of it. Uh, there's so much entertainment now that 
that uh, you know is popularized in movies and TVs that is for such a, a small particular segment, um, which is kind of I find quite disappointing these days. Uh, but Star Wars is something for the, the entire family, um, and st- again, Star Wars is adaptable to. It's proven to be adaptable to uh, every new uh, generation. And I think we saw that uh, just uh, the the night, uh, you know, with Disney. It's got uh, Phineas and Ferb, and I think uh, they it looks like they've got other shows that they're planning to, you know, do Star Wars themed specials. You know, it's it's those kind of things that Disney's able to do um, after they acquired Lucasfilm that I think will really help to ensure that, uh, Star Wars and, and Rebels, uh, continue to be applicable to, you know, future generations. Absolutely. It just adds so much, um, this world building and, the, and these exciting characters and, and something you mentioned before, uh, transitions perfectly to our next question, which is, uh, regarding J.R.L. Tolkien, excuse me, regarding J.R.R. Tolkien and, you, of course, are a fan of Tolkien's universe. In your opinion, how are George Lucas and J.R.R. Tolkien's work similar? Right, yeah. I think uh, just, just so listeners uh, will, will be aware of, of my, my personal interest, um, you know, I've spent a lot of time uh, in New Zealand on and off the last few years. Uh, and I am a big fan of uh, Lord of the Rings and Ho- The Hobbit and and the Peter Jackson's movies. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I've been been there for um, the, uh, the the premiere for the, the first Hobbit movie. Wow. But, um, yeah. <laughs> yes, I, I'm, I'm a devoted fan. I, and I, I've written a little bit about uh, the Hobbit tourism. Um, but. Uh, yeah, I think uh, it's it's something I hadn't thought about, but I think uh, I think you're you're definitely onto something. There there are a lot of similarities. Um, both both Tolkien uh, and uh, George Lucas have spent a lifetime essentially a cra- crafting these two these two worlds, these two universes. Um, put put you know it's it's been a life's work for each one. And uh, my understanding is that uh, Tolkien was uh, influenced in writing, you know, his his villains in Sauron and the Orcs um, from his experience in World War One, uh, and uh, the the military uh, industries uh, that, and horrors that he witnessed. Uh, my understanding is uh, that uh, the Empire is also um, based on uh, you know the World Wars. Uh, in Star Wars, uh, and I think uh, both both in Star Wars and Lord of the Rings, uh, the important th- themes uh, include loyalty and friendship. Um, we see that uh, particularly in Star Wars in the, the original trilogy, we see that uh, play out with uh, obviously with Luke and Leia and Han. Uh, and Chewie and the gang, uh, we see how when relationships fall apart, you know, and what happens with that in the prequels. Uh, but obviously with the Fellowship and Lord of the Rings um, and uh, with the, the company of dwarves and Bilbo and the Hobbit, uh, how, how a pivotal uh, friendship and loyalty is there. Um, I think uh, themes of uh, hope. Uh, in both franchises, that no matter how dark it gets, uh, the importance of hanging on to hope, um, the idea that anybody can contribute. Uh, as I said, uh, you know, in Lord of the Rings, we have that uh, with the, the hobbits being such uh, unlikely creatures being being the center of these stories. Um, and I think I think the fact that uh, both Star Wars and Lord of the Rings take place in uh, times and places that are, that are outside of uh, you know our experience outside of the real world that helps to make both franchises um, something uh, you know e- eternal and, and legendary and uh, you know an interesting uh, fact about uh, about uh, Peter Jackson and, and what his team in New Zealand and Lucasfilm is the fact that, that there is this 
um, friendly uh, uh, respect and admiration between both companies. And, and Dave Filoni has talked about that, uh, his friendship with guys over there. And I think he shared um, online a, a drawing he'd done that he'd, he'd sent to one of the guys of um, Gandalf and Yoda. So, yeah, there is this, uh, there is a connection in themes and also just a, a friendly relationship between both companies, I think. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Adam, you uh, brought so many fascinating things, which is just showing all of our listeners how much there is uh, with your work and your passion for Star Wars. And, and you certainly delivered as promised. So we really appreciate you coming on to have a cup of coffee with us. And before we Thank let you, you. Oh, our pleasure. Our pleasure. And, and before we let you go, of course, we have to ask you our five questions. And, and uh, I'll just go ahead and start with the first one. What is your favorite Star Wars movie? Uh, that would have to be Return of the Jedi. Um, that I I was old enough that I you know I, uh, I had a lot of energy to put into uh, my excitement of that movie. I still remember the first time that I saw uh, the the trailer in the morning and how excited I got. To, uh, it was so early, and I just ran into my parents' room and woke them up to, to tell them about about the trailer. I'm sure they knew all about it already, but I, I was so excited. I just had to tell somebody, even if I had to get them up out of bed early in the morning. Isn't that the best? I, I, those are the kind of memories that make Star Wars uh, still stand the test of time for all of us. Absolutely. I also think we still do that as, as adults. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we just get on uh, Twitter and Facebook and tell everybody about it. <laughs> That's right. So, Adam, who is your favorite Star Wars character? You know that is really hard uh, because I think, uh, like like a lot of uh, kids and like a lot of kids, that uh, you know, I, uh, especially when I was younger, I'd go through a fad where you know, this week my my favorite character is Han Solo, and next week my favorite character is Wicket. And, you know, next week it's it's Jabba the Hutt. Uh, so that that's a tough one. Um, I don't know if I could really choose. Uh, I do, I do like uh, I do like the stinkers. I like uh, Job of the Hut. I like Zero the Hut. I was so sad that he he got killed <laughs> in Clone Wars. <laughs> I'm, I'm still I'm still hoping to bring him back. We don't really know for sure that he's dead or not. Um, yeah, I I love Cad Bane. I think uh, he's he's one of uh, the the greatest uh, villains, uh, bounty hunters in Star Wars. I I hope we see more of him in the future. Um, uh, yeah, there there's so many that that's a toughie. Um, if if I had to uh, to pick just one though, on the spur of the moment, I, I might say the the ha- Hammerhead. I think is. I think his official name in the EU is some like Momo Nadon or Momo something Nadon. like that. Yeah, but yeah. He's just he's just a cool classic uh, character. I, I love those hammerheads. Well, the the, the Kenner action figure really made that that figure so awesome. You know, all those Cantina characters really. So Absolutely. What, so, so Adam, what is your favorite line of dialogue or film moment? Sure. Um, well, the, the dialogue, you know, I love, I love a lot of Han Solo's lines, especially in, in, in A New Hope. Um, but to be truthful, I'd have to say the the dialogue that I actually, I connected the most, uh, with a kid and probably recite uh, often as an adult is the the non-English, uh, things, you know, the, the, the little, uh, Jawa phrases, the Utini and, Mm. uh, you know the the heckling that um, salacious crown does. Uh, that that laugh had, had a profound influence on me. I used to used to do that uh, laugh all the time uh, as a kid. I got quite good at it. Um, and uh, yeah, the, all the little Ewok uh, phrases and stuff. The Ewokies, you know. I, <laughs> I, I I loved all the the alien the alien dialect and noises as a kid. Well, we, we actually even had uh, the voice of Slicious Crumb, Mark Dotson, on uh, back in early July, too. And he did the voice for us a couple of times. Really, really, really fun. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so, Adam, if you collect, what is your favorite collectible that you own? Oh, gosh, that's hard. Um, <laughs> I, 
on and off. I, I have been a, a bit of a Kenner Hasbro action figure addict, uh, so I've I've tr- had to try to keep that under control. Um, I think, uh, yeah. So of the original figures, um, again, I, I really like the Hammerhead. He's he's probably he probably personifies um, my. Uh, just my my feelings and uh, my experience with the uh, Star Wars, the, with my my earliest memories, or or any of the the original Kenner Cantina uh, alien figures, um, but I do like uh, these the new uh, well they're they're not new now but uh, the the more recent uh, vintage collection that uh, Hasbro has put out, uh, and I certainly hope they I'm cer- certainly hope they'll. Uh, reinstitute that in the near future i i think the assumption is they will when episode seven is released that they'll revive that line but um i think of their their new figures that they put out that that new vintage collection gamorian guard with the the removable helmet and the three three weapons and that that fuzzy uh furry uh tunic he's got on that that is pretty cool that's near museum quality uh, a piece right there so uh, that, that I've got a few of those. Oh, oh, I very much agree. You're you're certainly a man after my own heart, and I'm hoping that if they do uh, reintroduce the vintage line, that they will put uh, prequel characters in in the Kenner style. That would be awesome. Absolutely, yeah. So, Adam, what particular messages or themes about the Star Wars saga resonate or speak to you? Well, I think. Uh... The, the most powerful um, is uh, the, the the theme of sacrifice, love, and redemption. Uh, the fact that we've got uh, three movies, um, if you, you separate them out, of the original trilogy that are all about uh, the, the redemption of one of cinema's greatest villains, uh, and the the love and sacrifice that uh, that his you know son goes through to try to save him, that's that's really powerful. Um, and uh, the you know the the idea of the the way the the main characters are, are sacrificing themselves for each other uh, with uh, Han and Leia and Luke, uh, you know, again and again. That's that's those are great powerful themes. Um, the idea that that there is always hope, you know, no no matter how uh, dark things get. Um, in uh, the end of uh, um, Revenge of the Sith, you know, <laughs> everything is uh, you know destroyed and gone, uh, but there's still there's still hope. Uh, so I think that that's great. Um, and the idea that that everyone has value. Uh, every person has value, no matter how small and no matter how insi- uh, insignificant they are. That um, you know, Yoda says size matters not. Uh, I think it was maybe the very first episode of the Clone Wars where you know that Yoda establishes that all of the clones have value as individual mm-hmm. uh, people. That uh, it, it could have been very easy. To you know, have dehumanized uh, the clones um, at least starting out, you know, and treat them you know like like robots and you know non humans and like they don't have value because they're just copies of each other. But uh, the fact that each one has has value uh, that that's a wonderful message. Uh, so yeah, there there's a lot of really really good themes in, in Star Wars. Beautifully said, my friend, and and very very true. I th- and one of the things that I think is why people gravitate towards Star Wars so much is because these are all important lessons and themes and concepts uh, that we hope are applied to aspects of the real world, let alone a fictional universe that we love so much. So thank you for putting that so beautifully. Absolutely. Uh, Adam, uh, how can folks and fans get a hold of your book and get a hold of you online? Well, my book, uh, both books, uh, The Rebel's Visual Guide and uh, Star Wars, What Makes a Monster, are uh, available in stores now. Uh, So you can get that uh, them both at your local bookstore or on Amazon.com. And uh, the best way to uh, reach me and follow me is on Twitter 
And uh, my Twitter handle is uh, just author Adam Bray, all one word. Well, Adam, thank you again so much for uh, taking time out of your busy schedule to share a cup of coffee with us. Uh, the Star Wars, the visual guide, and in all of your wonderful books, we'll have links to them on our show notes. And thank you so much for your contribution to Star Wars, the Star Wars universe, and the fandom. And we certainly hope uh, we'll get to meet you someday soon and shake your hand. And thank you for all the great things you've done for Star Wars. Well, thank you, guys. It's been a real pleasure to be on with you. Absolutely, and we and we appreciate all all of your tweets and retweets, and uh, you just do a great job interacting with fans. And that's another reason why it's just so refreshing to be a Star Wars fan, because more than maybe any other genre thing going on, uh, the people who contribute to Star Wars and and help to make it what it is, uh, you are all so wonderful about reaching out to all of us. So we really appreciate that. Well, thank you. I know as a fan myself, I really appreciate it when, you know, everybody else uh, in the in the fan community and, uh, you know, the people that are, you know, in, involved at, at Lucasfilm uh, and, you know, everybody that's involved in, in making all these uh, wonderful Star Wars uh, uh, projects, you know, the, the, they are that friendly and they're that appro- approachable. And I appreciate, you know, everybody that's it's taken time to, you know, to see me uh, at Comic-Con and uh, to, to tweet to me and to tell me what they think about uh, my, my books. So, yeah, it's, it's been fantastic. Thanks again, Adam. And, and fans are going to really want to pick this book up. It's full of just packed with information, all kinds of details, and all kinds of great new characters we could get to meet. Uh, we certainly thank you for having coming on tonight and to speak with us about it. Oh, Absolutely. Our topic for show number 24 is Darth Maul. What do you love about the popular Sith Lord? How did you feel about his resurrection on the Clone Wars? And what does he add to the Star Wars mythology? Joining us on this topic is Star Wars collector and editor-in-chief of Cinelinks, Jordan Mason. In 500 words or less, be sure to send us an email or mp3 with your thoughts, comments, and opinions to feedback at coffeewithkenobi.com. We've had quite a few requests uh, for Coffee with Kenobi t-shirts, and right now we've got a special uh, offering going on at, at Teespring. Uh, we've got Coffee with Kenobi t-shirts uh, featuring the brand new logo. They're orange, blazing orange, we call it Rebel Orange uh, for fans out there. And Teespring offers kind of like a, a Kickstarter campaign. You, you order so many shirts and they get printed. Uh, we've got three shirts uh, uh, in order to get everything printed and, and out there. Uh, right now we're sitting at 23 soul out of the 30. Uh, so get out there and order a shirt, uh, support Coffee with Kenobi. All those efforts will be going towards uh, recording upgrades, future distributing fees, and even more uh, ways to tune into Coffee with Kenobi. So check it out. We definitely have space for uh, folks who want to get on board and, and go past 32. So any, every little bit uh, helps. So check it out. Um, for those looking for a different style, we've got a, a, an orange, like I said, and we got a, a blue. Uh, we call it our force blue color and the, the Ladies' tea style. Uh, so check them out. Twenty-eight dollars a piece, uh, and help us out and support. Thanks a lot. I like the sound of that. Echo three to Echo seven. Ah, nobody. You read me? I saw part of the message. You. I seem to have found it. Our first email comes from Melanie Price, and she writes. Back in 77, nine-year-old me bugged my mom to take me to see Star Wars. She did, and she let me see it 21 times that summer. (laughs) That's a lot. At Halloween, there were no Princess Leia costumes, so she designed and made one and even styled a mohair wig so I could have the right hairdo. And I won the school costume contest. Even though I was often a fan of one, I never stopped loving Star Wars. My mom never discouraged me about it or said it was only for boys. So when I was recently promoted at my work, what did my mom do? Flowers? Nope. A card? No way. Mom got me a 31-inch Darth Vader action figure. What else could I have gotten you, she says. Indeed. One of her cool mom moments. Thank you so much for the podcast. Quickly becoming my favorite. And that's Melanie Price. Awesome story, Melanie. Uh, I love the one about the Princess Leia costume. Uh, I know a lot of my costumes came from my parents just putting cardboard pieces together and getting things to do right because of the love of their children. And, and I think that's fantastic. What a great story. 
It's awesome. I, I love that she she wrote that. She sent that to our our Facebook email, and that was very cool to get from her. I, you know, what I'm glad about is that she mentions that you know this isn't a franchise that's just for boys. It's it's mm-hmm. for people who love Star Wars. It's not gender specific, but it's got elements that appeal to everyone. I like this. Um, and then she, her mom, who definitely got super cool mom of the year award in my <laughs> opinion, a throw in Star Vader action figure. Congratulations on your promotion, Melanie, and, and thanks for listening and and spreading the word about Star Wars and and once again reminding us that Star Wars. Is a powerful franchise for all fans. Thank you, Melanie. Our next email comes from loyal listener and friend of the show, Wayne Barnes, and he writes, Hey guys, Wayne here. Some thoughts on the Clovis Ark and Padme and Anakin's relationship. It seems to get criticized, but I wonder if it isn't supposed to be a sweeping romantic love story more akin to the Han Leia story. Maybe we're not supposed to support it in that way. I tend to look at Pat Anakin and Padme's relationship through the lens of it being an affair between two married people. They're both committed to other bodies, the Jedi and politics. Sure, they are married, but nobody knows it's their little secret. They sneak around, lying to the people that they're closest to, stealing moments when they can. It's never open and honest. It's always in shadow. That has to take its toll. What's interesting to me, as we see in the Clovis arc, what appears to be problematic is when they actually get too much time together. When Anakin is around to actually see that there are other men out there, it sets them afire. Time together is the exception in this relationship. We know he's spending days and days at a times away on missions. By the time of Re- Revenge of the Sith, there had been so little contact, we actually hear from her that she wasn't even sure he was still alive. The relationship seems to be ideal in its passing form. Less contact keeps the spark. Absence actually makes their hearts grow fonder. It's a hobby marriage, and when it gets real, with real problems and day-to-day challenges, it's out of the dream state. Lucas once joked that what split them up was something like he kept leaving his socks on the bed. Maybe he wasn't joking. That's pretty astute. Successful marriages tend to be those that deal with adversity rather than avoid it. Don't see that much here. It's amazing that a kid's show, such as The Clone Wars, can flesh out this sector of their relationship so well. While people complain that the prequels didn't portray a realistic or believable love story, I'd actually counter that maybe that's the point. Maybe it's not realistic as a love story, but as a story of passion and infidelity in the perimeter of a PG children's film. It's extremely solid. Pretend for a second that Anakin and Padme, two married individuals, had gone away to a business convention in Vegas instead of Naboo. They hang out, have dinner a few times, maybe even go to the top of the stratosphere. Then one day, there's an accidental kiss. Padme realizes what's happening, thinks of her family, and pushes him away. Anakin's confused. Time passes. The convention's about over, and Anakin decides to go for broke and pushes his luck. No dice. Cooler heads prevail. They come home from their trip, essentially returning to their normal life. And let's just say the plane starts to crash, and as they're plummeting to a certain death, they haunt, they're haunted by what could have been. Nothing to lose. Now, in an uncertain future... Padme tells him her regrets, wishes she hadn't put up a wall. They kiss. Miraculously, the plane pulls up at the last second. They survive and their families meet them at the airport. Now imagine, instead of a secret wedding, they're actually in the film with Padme meeting Anakin in the hotel room. Looking at it with this undercurrent, maybe we're not supposed to root for it to succeed. We don't give the same weight to their commitment to politics or the Jedi Order as we would to their spouses. But nonetheless, they are betraying those institutions. Just throwing that out there. Additional note regarding the Ark, look at Anakin's bedroom compared to the rest of the Jedi. He has stuff, lots of it. Yoda has a couple of chairs, and that's it. Anakin has mementos. The poster, an in-joke about Ben Quadraneros, is actually very telling. He's saying on to the Boonta classic experience the way he hung on to his experiences with Padme from Phantom Menace. He keeps trophies, and that's from Wayne Barnes. Well, Wayne, thank you for this awesome email. Wayne has just a great way of looking at things in Star Wars. He opens my mind all the time to whenever I see something that he's sent our way. But I love the idea of the fact that they're committed to their bodies. When he says the Jedi and politics, those are the bodies are married that they're committed to uh, an affair between two married people. And, and it's, he's really right on. I, I didn't really think about it this way before, but the fact that their relationship clearly not a traditional marriage, 
um, and it, and there's a lot of absence makes a heart grow fonder because they're never together, but they don't get the chance to grow and together and learn and love through ups and downs of reality because half the time he's at war in the Clone Wars. That's not to say they don't have a lot of quality moments that they're not in love because I'm not arguing that, but I am saying that there's definitely a fantasy element inside the fantasy that Wayne points out really interestingly. It'd be interesting to hear what um, our blogger, Becca, who's also a, a great blogger for the Cantina cast. Uh, hey, Mike and Joe, what's up, fellas? High five. It'd be interesting to see uh, what she thought of this email. Definitely a high five. And I will say as well, I, just reading through this too, is, yeah, that connection of, of having that traditional marriage is not what we think it is. I think we always hear the word marriage, we compare it to the traditional marriage of of two people. And this is obviously wartime makes me think of, you know, husbands and wives that were going off to World War II or even now, you know, the Iraqi war and the current war and just leaving their families and, and the relationship they have coming back and are in dispersing between going on tours and things like that. And the brokenness that's the, that's there and that connection is, is very um, straining, you know, mm. and he brings up some great points here. I'm really glad that our listeners write in and give us such passionate emails uh, that they obviously show us that, that, you know, they care just as much about this as we do as fans. And uh, just, they always seem to, you know, throw their, their hat into the ring as far as, you know, giving their feedback. And it's always something that I am impressed and, and I've never heard before. So I and really enjoy it. Our last email comes from Jeff Rooney. And he says, I mailed your show by clicking on the album art on the podcast app. Thanks for including it. It makes it so easy to email our show. Uh, he has a quick question. He asks, I had an idea to grow the Star Wars fandom leading into the release of Star Wars Episode Seven. Why don't all Star Wars fans encourage all friends and family members to watch the original trilogy at least once and maybe invite them to see Episode 7 with that fan, if possible? With the use of Facebook and larger mix of crowd of Facebook friends with varied backgrounds, I'm noticing more people m- mentioning that they have never seen any Star Wars movies. I think we need to, to nicely do what we can to change that. What do you think? Can we make this initiative on your podcast? Jeff Rooney. Certainly, Jeff. It's uh, I think anybody who hasn't watched the films should be introduced to them by by any means, uh, by any viewing order that they feel comfortable doing, and and any you know checking out the Clone Wars or any whatever the age range is, they can certainly jump in at any point and enjoy it. I think. Um, I think as far as you know, banding together as, as podcasts, I think that's definitely something that all podca- Star Wars podcast strive to do. Uh, just to include friends uh, on Facebook and obviously family members uh, and fans alike, just to be able to to inter- involve each other with Star Wars, we we build into Episode Seven. Uh, but yeah, I, I would definitely encourage. You know, I, I've got some of my younger kids who haven't seen the movies, kind of in their full, uh, if you will, and be able to really appreciate them if, uh, as fans. And I, you know. Would definitely love to sit in theaters with my kids and get their reactions on episode seven, how everything connects, and I just look forward to all that. Um, and just to be able to, yeah, I guess, yeah, I, I guess he's kind of promoting to kind of transcribe that and in, in, into a podcast of, of some kind. And we kind of, it would be kind of neat to see like a before and after. I know, Dan, you and I had talked about maybe doing a, a, a pre uh, episode seven showing, uh, or I'm sorry, a pre episode show before watching episode seven and then you know, recording right after just to kind of balance the thoughts and, and get immediate reactions. Yeah. Still trying to kind of put that together and figure out um, how to do something of that nature. Cause that would be, that would be great. I'd love to do it from the theater, but you know, who knows where we'll be when it's time for episode for sure. seven to premiere. But I like the idea too. I've been, I've been rallying for a long time to try to get people who have not seen star Wars uh, in the classroom or with my family and friends. And most of my friends have seen it. I'm still trying to get my wife to get through all six of them. And, and honestly, I think it's more fun to watch it with her on the big screen. So I'm hoping, I'm still hoping that they will release uh, the rest of the films in 3D in theaters. No, no idea if that's actually going to happen in the near future or not at all. But I agree. Let's grab your friends, your family, your loved ones who haven't seen Star Wars and make it even more of a strong community than we already have. And, 
And that's kind of one of the things that makes the world go round as far as Star Wars fandom getting everybody involved. So, so great ideas here. Chewie, get us out of here! If you would like to respond to our question of the show, have a comment, or just want to say hello, send us an email or MP3 at feedback at coughwithkenobi.com. Or if you have a specific question or comment for either of us individually, email us at danz at coughwithkenobi.com or Corey C at coughwithkenobi.com or visit us at coughwithkenobi.com and click on the Contact Us section or comment on one of the stories featured on the site. If you enjoy the show, please write a review on iTunes. You can also like the show on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash coughwithkenobi as well as keep up to date on our Twitter feed at twitter.com forward slash coughwithkenobi. You can also find us on Tumblr at coughwithkenobi.tumblr.com. If you enjoy the jazz music, download the album Eye to Eye by Steve Torok on iTunes. Give the evacuation code signal. That's it for show number 23 of Coffee with Kenobi. A big thank you to Adam Beret for having a cup of coffee with us and discussing Star Wars Rebels, the visual guide. Be sure to check out our show notes for a link on how to purchase this great resource for Rebels. Thanks to Rob of the Bearded Trio, to everyone who contributed to this show, and to all of you out there who listen to and email Coffee with Kenobi each and every week. Don't forget to send us your comments and opinions on the topic for show number 23, Darth Maul. This is the podcast you're looking for. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars-related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. There's no one here. Move along. Move along.